The days of the pioneers are not past. There are modern pioneers whose achievements are an inspiration to all of us. In every nation, in every worthy occupation and activity, members of this church face hardships, overcome obstacles, and follow the servants of the Lord Jesus Christ as valiantly as the pioneers of any age. I was living in Mandeville, Jamaica, and I was working at an alumina plant in October of 1973. I was in an office that was close to a friend of mine, Paul Schmeil. I was reading the Bible in my office, as I usually did at that time, during lunchtime, and Paul came in and he said, what are you reading? I said, I'm reading the Bible. He said, um, do you like to read the scriptures? And I said, yes. He said, uh, which church are you a member of? And I said, none. And he said, why? And I said, because none of them is true. And I saw his eyes open wide. And he said, would you like to know about my church? And I said, yes. After seven and a half years in the Air Force, I was interviewing for some jobs. Kaiser Aluminum came to Las Vegas and interviewed me, and what makes it offered us a job, we accepted it and came straight to Jamaica. I was not a member of the church. Marilyn was a lifetime member. I'd heard the discussions, but had not accepted it. The first week we were in the hotel in Mandeville, and the Whitfield family members of the church came to the hotel and found out who we were. and. Sister Whitfield said to me, Marilyn, we need you, and you need us. Uh, the Whitfield family was in Mandeville, where we were. Then the Bills family were living in Kingston. We started joining them, making the trek back and forth on these meetings. Our branch president gave us a, a large Book of Mormon, so we read it every night, and uh, by the end of the year, we'd finished it. And After having gone through the Book of Mormon, I knew that without a doubt in my heart that it was true and that if it was true, the church was true. And so I was baptized in December 1970, about uh, 10 months after we got there. I had a reason to go see him, Victor Nugent, at work. And it was about lunchtime and Victor was reading the scriptures. And I said, what church do you belong to? And he said, well, I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness, but I found that it wasn't teaching the truth what's in the Bible. So. My family and I are having Sunday school in our home. I then asked if I could tell him something about the Mormon church. My father was actually um, leader of the congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses in our little town. I was as young as three years old. I used to go with my father to preach the gospel to just about everybody, our friends and neighbors. And we would go from door to door on Saturdays or Sundays and preach the gospel. When I was in high school or thereabouts, I started to have doubts about the, the veracity, the truthfulness of this doctrine. I started reading the scriptures for myself. And by the time I got to university, then I sort of grew in disbelief. But I had been so convinced that Jehovah's Witness was the only true church that I said, if they are not true, if the Bible cannot explain the things as they are, then maybe Maybe God doesn't even exist. Maybe the Bible isn't true. So I became an agnostic. By the time I graduated from university, I had lost my moral compass, and I was going down the primrose path, as I would say. I did so many things I'm really ashamed of. Uh, it got so bad that one night when I was coming home from a party in, in Kingston that I felt so bad, I, I, I said to myself, you know, Victor, this is not you. This is not Victor, who used to be such a devout Christian. I stopped the car. I knelt down on the side of the road. And for the first time in about 10, maybe 15 years, I prayed. I uttered a prayer. It was a vocal prayer. It wasn't structured, but it was really intense. 
I'd never prayed so intensely before in my life. And I don't remember exact words that I said, but I remember the essence of it was, oh God, if you are God, if you're really there, please help me. In answer to that prayer, I almost instantaneously had a feeling of calm, of peace. To the if there was somebody saying to me, it's okay, you'll be all right, just go home and read the scriptures and believe everything you read, even if you don't understand it, just believe and accept it. And I did that. And for the next few years, I read the scriptures assiduously. Where as it were, my eyes were opened. I was, I was enlightened because this time, instead of just reading the scriptures to find passages that will prove doctrinal points, it was as if I was there seeing things that were happening in the scriptures. I began to understand the scriptures more clearly. I began to understand who I was, where I came from, who Heavenly Father is, and what He expects of us. I began to understand that Heavenly Father loves us as His children, and that when He wants to tell us things or He wants to give us direction, He calls one person, a prophet, and He speaks directly to that prophet. I began to understand that Heavenly Father wants us to live a certain way. He wants us to obey His commandments. If we obey His commandments, we are blessed. If we don't obey His commandments, then the opposite happens. I also understood that you need special authority to administer the affairs of Heavenly Father's kingdom. Because when this understanding came to me, I said to myself, well, I don't know of any church in the world who preaches or practices these concepts. And I said to myself, what should I do now? And the first thought that came to my mind was, well, you know, since you understand this, well, maybe you better start a church for yourself. And almost instantly, the thought came to me, no, you can't do that. You need authority, as it said, says in Hebrews. No man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. And I wasn't called of God, so what do I do? Well, the thought came to me then, and I think I was being directed. Read the scriptures, read them every day, and practice what you understand from reading the scriptures. And for a period of three years, Every day I was reading the scriptures. And that is how come Paul noticed me, <laughs> because I was reading the scriptures in my lunchtime, and he was in the office next to mine. One evening when my husband, Victor, came home from work, he told me that one of his co-workers, Paul Schmeil, was asking if he could come over and tell us about his church. I thought it a little unusual that Victor seemed so interested in having someone come and tell him about the church because he had not been active in any church for a long time. But then he told me that Paul was just such a remarkable person and he wanted to hear what made him so different. So he came the second Wednesday in November of 1973 and he flipped the chart and read from the discussion book, gave us a lesson. And he showed us two films on a film strip projector and instantly I recognized that this was what I've been searching for all my life. When I saw Joseph Smith's first vision, I knew that Joseph was telling the truth, that God and Jesus Christ did appear to him, and that Joseph was the instrument in the hands of God to restore the kingdom on earth. I started reading the Book of Mormon that night after he left, and I'll never forget, I finished reading the Book of Mormon before that Sunday, so it was about three days. And I instantly had a firm testimony that the Book of Mormon is true. It fitted so perfectly with what I had read in the scriptures. It explained so perfectly who I am, where I came from, what I'm doing here and why, and where I could go after this life. So I went and I prayed and I received a confirmation. And this was a true principle. Because for the first time in my life, I felt you know, the Spirit of God present so strongly. The gospel itself, it answered every question I had. I'd been searching for something like this for so long. And then all of a sudden, here it was. The Heavenly Father had sent someone to me. I knew without a doubt that this was the true gospel. I decided that I wanted to and needed to be baptized into the true church. I said, I know that I want salvation. I know that Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father appeared to Joseph Smith and that this is the true church of God upon the earth. And if I want to, be, to receive my salvation, if I want to get direction from God directly, I need to become a member of this church. 
Now, in 1976, there was a lot of political upheaval in Jamaica. All the American saints left for one reason or the other. And so my wife and I and two children were the only LDS left on the island. We decided that we were going to have church, even though we didn't have the priesthood. And we had our Sunday school, and I taught one Sunday school class to one child, and Verna taught a Sunday school class to the other child. And I tell you, these were very special times, very precious, because during this time, we learned more about the gospel, I think, than we have learned anywhere else. And we studied the, the manuals, and we studied the handbook, so we knew what we were supposed to do. That during that period of time, we had certain challenges. Of course, we couldn't take the sacrament, we couldn't pay tithing, and we couldn't baptize anybody or bless or ordain anybody. My second son, third child, was born in July of 1976, and we wanted to have him blessed. The mission president couldn't send anybody out, so we were blessed that we were able to take him up to Florida to the mission home and have him blessed there. My eldest daughter, she came of age and she needed to be baptized. Nobody to baptize her. Again, we were blessed that we were able to take her up to Fort Lauderdale and we had her baptized in the mission president's swimming pool. Those are really great blessings. I was a young kid in high school and a cousin came from Montreal who invited me to continue my education in Canada in 1976. There I met the elders and then we started a conversation on the church and then I listened and I listened and I listened. Something moved me on the Book of Mormon. I believe the Book of Mormon was true. At that time in the church history, those who were from the lineage of Cain could not hold the priesthood. I accepted that because I knew the Book of Mormon was true. And nothing could drive me from the testimony I received from when I, when I read the Book of Mormon. It was simply the Book of Mormon. I took the invitation of the elders to read it sincerely and to pray to the Lord about it. I got the answer from the Lord, not the one I expected, but I accepted the answer for the Lord and I went ahead and joined the church. I kept having these reoccurring dreams that I would serve a mission. I would, I would walk down the road with a companion, that I would walk down the roads of Kingston. And I said, I couldn't serve a mission because I couldn't be ordained to the priesthood. And so it didn't make sense. After living in Canada for a while, I was impressed to return to Jamaica for some reason. It just didn't make sense, but the Lord was kind of saying, I need you to go back to Jamaica. I even flew over to England to see if I would like to move there with an aunt. And, and still, I kept having this dream and this feeling, I got to go back to Jamaica. So I, went, I moved back from England to Canada and then back to Jamaica. I wrote the mission president, President Millet, and he got me in touch with Brother Nugent. We both were in the same situation in the church. We both accepted the Book of Mormon. We both loved the gospel, but we were from Mandeville to Kingston. And there was no church, and the Nugents were holding Sunday school in their home at that time. So I then would begin the journey by taking a bus from Kingston, go down to the train station, take a train all the way to Mandeville, take a robot up into Mandeville. Brother Nugent would meet me. I was staying up overnight at his house because we didn't hold the priest. We couldn't bless the sacrament. We couldn't pass the sacraments. We'd just have a Sunday school class of 45 minutes, and, and then he would take me back all the way to Kingston. We were the only two families that were active in the church at that time. we just get the work going. We would just go out and proselyte as members together without the priesthood, without a mission call, we'll try to teach a couple of families. But we kept praying, Brother Nugent prayed, I prayed. We kept asking, when can the church start? The path of modern pioneers is not easy. As modern pioneers press forward, they suffer hardships and make sacrifices. They sacrifice immediate pleasures to keep commitments that are eternal. I had this urgent desire to share the gospel and you know the kingdom has, has been established on earth heavenly father has spoken to man again after so many years and the church is here and i need to share this with everybody i know and i did i told just about everybody and i went and taught many of them in early june of this year the first presidency announced that a revelation had been received by president spencer w kimball extending priesthood and temple blessings to all worthy male members of the church. Personally, I never expected to have the priesthood in my life. I knew that eventually the priesthood would be given, 
to everyone, but um, I was convinced that I would never hold a priesthood in my life. But that it didn't matter to me because I knew it was a true principle and I, I didn't need to have the priesthood to have my salvation. I was after salvation, not authority and power or, or anything like that. I'll never forget that day. The mission president was in Puerto Rico, President Millet, and he called me and he said, Brother Nugent, are you sitting down? And I said, no, I was in my office uh, <laughs> at the lab. He said, sit down. <laughs> so I sat down and he gave me this shocking news <laughs> that he said President Elder Ballard had called him and told him about the priesthood revelation. And, you know, I just broke down. <laughs> it was really a shock to me, not just a surprise, it was a shock. And he told me about the priesthood revelation. I mean, I was taken aback. I had to ask again. And I realized, of course, that my husband could hold the priesthood. My son, it was overwhelming. It was definitely overwhelming. I cried and I laughed, but I was so thankful. I thanked Heavenly Father. It was, it was just overwhelming. And when that day came, It was special. And then we just started to have fun. We said, you know, the Lord gave us the priesthood. We're now gonna make sure that we can have the church in Jamaica. And then we're on three families, we built the church. I might say the day must called me in Puerto Rico right after I'd called Brother Nugent. He said, does that mean I can go on a mission now? I said, you sure can. And so we then began to process his paper so that he could serve a mission. He was assigned to the Fort Lauderdale Mission, and he was one of the first six missionaries we sent to Jamaica, back to the country where he'd grown up. I had plans to do other things. Opportunities opened to me to go to England and India as far as my employment, and then all of a sudden the revelation came from a prophet of the Lord. Everything was turned upside down. But when the revelation came through and the call came, I knew ahead that's where the Lord wanted me for some reason. We will never forget the morning of December 5, 1978. It was so thrilling that I can't even describe the feeling we had. Elder Ballard was here to de dedicate the island of Jamaica for missionary work. And that morning, we got up very early, uh, before daylight. And just about everybody who was there got up and bore fervent, sweet testimony that the true church of Jesus Christ is has been established on the earth, and Jamaica was about to become a significant part of it. Elder Ballard then invited us to kneel on the grass, and then he delivered the dedicatory prayer. He prayed fervently that we, the members here, though we are few in numbers, that we would be strong, and that through us, the gospel would be spread throughout the island. And as the dedicated prayer said, eventually the island would be dotted with chapels. It was so thrilling to us. It made me feel, yes, we are being blessed. The church is going to grow, and I began to actually see things. Progress will be here, and it was so exciting. All the people of Jamaica, he pronounced the blessing on all of us, he promised us that if we would be faithful, that Heavenly Father would magnify our efforts. And we would be instruments to bring the gospel to many people. The, the closing hymn was, the spirit of God like a fire is burning. And believe me, it was burning there in my heart and in the hearts of all those who were there at that time. In the highest be given, forth and forever, amen and amen. I gave the, the first set of missionaries a list of about 100 people that I referred to them to be taught. And so they went teaching about every day. We would go and split to the missionaries. So we, we were able to cover a lot of territory. We had several baptisms and then we had investigators. We had meetings in our home. It wasn't just like Sunday meetings. We had socials on Fridays. We had firesides on probably Tuesdays or Wednesdays. People just came in droves, and the average attendance in my home in Mandeville at that time was about 50. And when he get, get, got up to six to seven at one point, 
the mission president decided, you know, that was too much because people had to be sitting in the in the in the corridors and on the port, front porch. Or we had to move the piano to the living room so that we could fit chairs in there for these people. The gospel began to go forward so well because of those that the Nugents would invite to hear the gospel that the missionaries, the six missionaries we sent there, could not cover all of their appointments. Just unbelievable support because every time we would visit, there would be 20 or 30 people to listen to the gospel, and they were just busy, busy, busy. The missionaries were teaching, and, then, and the Nugents in turn nurturing them. At that time, I had a 15-passenger van, and so I used that quite effectively, pick up the members and take them to church. We'd also take them to church functions as far away as Kingston. We'd go an hour's drive. That was fun because we had an opportunity to share experiences with each other, to share our testimonies, to sing the hymns, and just get to know each other. That was really fun. I didn't consider it a burden. I would make sometimes two, even three trips before church. And of course, after church, I would take them home. And they were always very grateful for that. And I enjoyed doing it. We brought in families, built a church in Manival, built a church in Kingston. Slowly but surely, we saw all the miraculous things that were happening. Well, the fact that I ran into Victor Nugent and was able to share the gospel was, to me, the Lord's hand in it, because here I am, a a young convert to the church, never been on a mission. When we thought to, talked of coming to Jamaica, it just seemed to be the right thing to do. We never even questioned. It seemed like a great opportunity. The Whitfield family was here. The Bills family were here. And they were here, we feel, to teach Paul. And then we were here so that Paul could be of a hand in teaching the Nugents. And we see that beautiful pattern continuing as the Nugents have taught others. It's just experience upon experience. As long as we follow our testament and what we're doing, it's not necessarily easy. And life has faced all of us with challenges. I'm grateful to the Lord to have been, been part of such a great work. I remember the day of my baptism very clearly. I thought very seriously about it, because I never like to be in a situation that I say I want to be in and not do all I can to live up to it. I knew it was true. And as I went into the water, I came up feeling really, really new. And then I realized this is my new life. I just have to live it. The most important thing for me was the realization that God had come back to Earth. He had appeared to Joseph Smith with Jesus Christ, and he told him that none of the other churches were true, and that he would be instrumental in setting up the kingdom of God. I knew that was true. Now, with that knowledge, I mean, nothing else mattered. <laughs> because if Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ live, if they know us, if they want to help us, like they did throughout the ages, and if there was a prophet on earth today, I mean, that's all I need to know. That's all I need to know. They do as the Savior taught. They deny themselves. They take up their crosses daily. They follow Him. These are those the Savior likened to the seed that fell on good ground. In an honest and good heart, having heard the word, they keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. <laughs>